So it's, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to uh, be here. Um, after um, I've been there ages ago, I believe, and so it's a real pleasure to see uh, this uh, vibrant community of young students and researchers. I'm especially delighted to be invited by a physicist uh, that attests to the fact that studying biological sciences, and in particular how shapes uh, arise, is a very interdisciplinary field of research. And so um, my talk tonight is uh, very concisely uh, when's biological forms. As uh, Arjun mentioned, uh, indeed, uh, biological forms are um, a source of question and mystery for many. And I would like to um, lead you through a journey into science to, that will um, um, lead you to see how um, scientists have come to uh, um, crack the mystery of how biological forms arise. And so uh, first, I would like to uh, present to you a few known facts, but just as a way to sort of uh, contemplate the extreme diversity and beauty of the living world. So we know that organisms are very diverse in shape and structures. That is true of adult organisms. But in fact, if you look more carefully at cells using a microscope, you will see that a cross scale from a few microns. Uh, I don't know if I have a pointer, for instance, or I could actually just uh, use my pointer here. You will see that cells uh, of a few microns could have structures that are extremely ordered. Um, these young algae uh, on the top right, or actually very much bigger cells, or these extremely complex neurons, the Purkinje uh, cells, show that indeed uh, the world of cells is also extremely diverse in terms of uh, shapes and structures. And of course, biologists could be overwhelmed by this diversity of shapes and structures. And uh, we would like to understand what uh, are the uh, principles governing the emergence uh, of such shapes. Are all shapes possible? and how do they uh, end up being so reproducible. So in fact, it is not only diverse, but it turns out that if you look at across many examples of living forms, we do find that there are as if convergence on universal geometries. And I give you a few examples out of many others. So for instance, you could see uh, at the top polygons. Um, they need not be very perfectly uh, ordered hexagons. You have in mind the honeybee uh, hives, but also if you look at turtles, corals, or this fungi, fungus on the top right, you would see really the uh, emergence of polygonal structures. And I'll show you later examples of cells in tissues that also tend to have polygon, polygonal structures. But also spirals from um, the ammonites uh, shells or uh, plants or even uh, pine cones. These show few examples of many spiral structures, or actually stripes that you could see in the pigmentations of many animals, or in a coral structures that you could see here. And, of, and in the end, also dome structures uh, that could be seen in uh, mushrooms or uh, jellyfish. So really, these are just examples to show that there seems to be something that constrains as if the shapes of uh, living organisms such that these universal geometric features arise over and over at different scales. And so this begs the question of what is the cause of this or the origin of this universality. So on top of that, it has been observed by everybody, whether you're a scientist or not, that actually forms are stable and reproducible. There's a first example of stability, which arises if you're a scientist, you use a microscope and look onto an organism or is even inside a cell, what you will see and what scientists have discovered in the past few decades is that actually cells and organisms are, you know, if you look across many hours and days, they are the same. But if you look very precisely, there is a perpetual current of matter of molecules and cells that turn over constantly. So it's, if it's a stationary structure, but it doesn't have the attribute of a stable building in which actually the bricks do not move from one day to another. So what underlies the stability of forms in the face of a current of matter that traverses it? And on top of this stability, which would be said the stability of an organism during its development and its living uh, in, during its life, there is also a stability of forms um, referred to as heredity. And an example that actually Erwin Schrodinger, the famous physicist in his book, What is Life, actually refers to in the first pages of the book, which is the example of the Habsburg family, where you could see in these paintings the very uh, conspicuous shapes of the chin which tells us something we know, which is that, of course, there is a, a resemblance to the parents across generations. And in the examples of mosquitoes, if you look at mosquitoes in amber uh, a few uh, 10 million years ago, they're actually the same in structure as the one that we could see today. So clearly, shapes have a stability 
that in fact can exceed the shape of geological structures because it took you know, a few tens of millions of years to produce the Alps in Europe. And within the time scales, mosquitoes haven't changed their shape at all. So what underlies the stability of structures in the face of this instability of the physical world at all the way down to atoms and structures and molecules? So that was the founding question that Erwin Schrodinger asked at the beginning of his book. And this is a question that we'll still ask ourselves today. So on top of these dynamics, there's also um, the fact that forms are on the, of the stability, yet we do know that forms are dynamic. And are dynamics across scales. The dynamic on the timescales of evolution, something which, uh, as we know, since Darwin, but actually pioneered by Lamarck in the beginning of the uh, 19th century. Lamarck, whom I should say, is the inventor of the world biology, which didn't exist before. He's uh, from his time at the early 19th century, actually, Lamarck coined the word so that biology became a discipline of its own before there was the natural sciences. And so with Lamarck and Darwin, we became to actually think about the evolution of species. And you all know this very famous last sentence from the book of the origin of species and why the planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So on top of this dynamics, there's also the dynamics of development. What happens in utero if you're a human or what happens you know, in the ocean if you're a fish. And so you could see here across scales how actually the development of forms. On the top left, you have a green alga, which is a, an extreme example of the um, emergence in front of your eyes of a shape of a cell as it divides. So you see this ornate shape of a cell in green. And as the cell divides, you can see sort of the daughter cells growing in structure and adopting the exact similar shape as the uh, mother cell that you see, the two halves on, on the left. So really like the emergence of a structure in front of your eyes. You could take the examples of a sea urchin embryo, which here you will see actually going through uh, its early division soon after fertilization. So the egg is seen as a spherical entity. You could see some movement in the so-called cytoplasm here. And soon the cell divides. And then other cell will divide. And it's as if these divisions are done with an extremely um, um, a timely uh, organized um, choreography of cell divisions, as if something was guiding the time and the direction along which cells would divide. And at even uh, longer time scales, you could see now a zebrafish embryo, a small fish where actually hundreds of thousands of cells that you cannot no longer see are actually collectively reorganizing themselves and moving so as to produce the uh, body axis of the embryo, the head in this region and the brain, and then the segments of the so-called somites along the body axis and the tail structure. So really, across scales, you could see that a development is a dynamic process whereby forms arise. And so really, my talk would be very much devoted to this kind of dynamics, the dynamics of developing structures, uh, which happens in all animals and even in plants. So starting from the general question, it is as if you can now identify three main questions, either broad questions, but different questions. What is the source of variation in evolution and changes during development? What are the how are forms reproducible? Because if you look at a cat and its descendants, it will be similar cats. What is the origin of universality that I referred to, the fact that there seems to be reproducible geometric structures that are seen across scales in different uh, animals and different plants? So um, going into and zooming in on the process of development, you could start with here the example of a oocyte being soon to be fertilized by a sperm. And on the right, this is, would be a human embryo uh, many days later that already has its characteristic uh, um, uh, organized structure along the main body axis, the anterior posterior axis, the formation of the limbs, and so on and so forth. So here, this leads me to introduce what has going to be a guiding theme during my talk today, which is the idea that given the stability of forms and the intrinsic dynamics of the internal constituents, which we'll see later on, there has to be some form of information that guarantees that the structures arise reproducibly. The structures need not be stable, but um, the information has to guarantee that the emergent shape is itself stable in time. And so, I'm going to use a metaphor 
to guide us through the question of information, which is that of living origamis. Of course, in an origami, we know that a perfectly organized sequence of folding patterns in which we have an information characterized by the order and the uh, kind of patterns of folding. There's also a mechanical operation of folding its, uh, the structures. We know that just playing with information and playing with the mechanical, single mechanical operation of folding, you could generate many, many different kinds of complex structures. We also know, we also know from practicing origami is that actually the very precision in which you do the folding has a key impact in the way that the structures arise. If you are not very precise at the beginning, you will propagate this defect, and indeed you will not be able to form the origami in the end. And so that metaphor leads us to think that how is it then that development does not lead to many catastrophes? It seems as if the process has a capacity to either be extremely precise or to cope with imprecisions that you correct the errors so that the outcome is reproducibly correct. On top of that, of course, this is just a metaphor. The information here is sort of added to the system from outside, but living system must build an information from within. And so I will guide you through the ways to think about information, starting from things that we all know and maybe leading to areas that might not have been so um, obvious to everybody in this room. So the two questions now that we'll ask are in sequence, what is the nature of the information that guides the emergence of form? And second question, what characterizes the flow of information that underlies the emergence of form? So we'll begin with the nature of information. And so I would like first to go through a quick historical overview of how great minds, great scientists have been thinking about the concept of what we would refer today as developmental information. It was certainly not called developmental information in the 17th century. But so let's go through the key steps. In the 17th century, we see a gradual evolution towards what I would refer to as sort of the internalization of the origin of movement. People knew from looking, even Aristotle, as you rightly said, that there was some kind of a movement in developing structures. But what is the origin of such movement? So if you followed the path of Galileo and Descartes, this is referred to as mechanicism. It really says that um, living matter is passive. It is like a machine. The fact is that the origin of movement is external to the living machine. It's heat that then produces a movement, and then all movement actually uh, occurring through direct contact between objects through the principle of inertia. So that is the way that we think of machines, the way that engines are built, and the way that car moves. But is it the same in, in, in living organisms? That is typically the way that people, following mathematical principles, would describe and consider living matter. It's a passive phenomenon, a passive process. Leibniz, however, at the turns of the 17th, 18th century, added a very uh, important conceptual turn to that. For him, the origin of movement is intrinsic. It is internal to the organism. It doesn't come from a heat propagating through the system. So life is a substance that is force in, uh, in his own uh, term. Leibniz's dynamics, which he invented in a way, accounts for the spontaneously active uh, aspect or nature of living systems. In today's parlance of physicists, um, he invented the concept of active matter. But of course, he didn't have an understanding of what active matter is the way we do it today. But the very nature of the intrinsic nature of dynamism uh, within organisms is a conceptual turn that Leibniz introduced um, in, uh, at the end of the 17th century, beginning of 18th century. So then we arrive in the 18th century, which you know is a key um, uh, 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 century in which materialist thinking, which was coming back from the Greek, re-emerged in a way to think about processes. And one important mind to bear in mind is Buffon. You probably know the series of books of the histo uh, natural history uh, book. But beyond these books and the drawing that comes with it are very key philosophical concepts. And there are three notions that he brought in the front to explain the emergence of shape. The first one is a concept of organic molecules. In French, it's actually exactly that, molecule organique. Then the notion of penetrating forces, which was really uh, um, thought out in the following Newtonian gravitational forces, which you know in France, uh, because of Descartes, had not been well received. But they, these philosophers of the 18th century actually tried to implement Newtonian gravitational forces to bear on the problem of living matter. 
And then the last more abstract notion is what he refers to as internal mold. It's, a, it's not a physical mold the way we think it, but it's something which is trying to account for the organization of molecules. So in a way, he doesn't provide a physical understanding of how forms arise, but he tries to bring the concept there. Another important uh, philosopher and scientist, Maupertuis, uh, uh, added the notion that, in fact, all particles that are in living organisms are endowed with properties of sensation, memory, even thought, and other properties such as that. And so they really, like matters, is really thinking and have sensation and all of that. And so the way that you would form an arm is that all the particles of an organism would recognize affinity with other particles of the arm, and they would self-organize, as we would say today in the 20th and 21st century, to, to reassemble an arm. So this is a way that they would think about the uh, production of structures from uh, elementary molecules or particles, as they were called then. Now, in the 19th century, this was an important turn with Claude Bernard, who really distinguished two kinds of forces. There would be physical chemical forces to account for the dynamics of living matter. But then there's another kind of forces called morphological forces that govern the formation of living organisms. So you know what is characteristics of living uh, organisms is their very organization. And so you could break down a cell, look under the microscope, see particles moving, and this would be living matter, but it's no longer a cell. And we come back to that distinction later on. So now we arrive at the key point of how to use that to think about development. And so there, there has been a major conceptual turn, again, in those particular 17th, 18th century. So as you know from the Greeks, there was two ways to think about development. The first one is referred to as what we would call later on preformation. And preformation was very much uh, uh, in rhyme with the notion of mechanics. Why? Because in a way, development is just an unfolding process. It's a growth process uh, associated with growth, and it has mechanical origin in itself. But the origin of shapes is not explained. It's going back to the origin of all living forms in a creationist framework. But development is mechanical and physical in, in nature. So another way to think is epigenesis. Going back to Aristotle, championed again by William Harvey in the 17th century, that actually accounts for the emergence of shape as a gradual process, an elaboration of structures from simple beginnings to more and more complex ones. This is, of course, the correct way to think about it. But the problem is that uh, people who would defend epigenesis in the 17th century would typically abandon the notion of physical forces or physical chemical processes driving the processes. They would rather be finalist and vitalist in nature following Aristotle's concept of entelechia. And so the question is how to take the best of both, in other words, to build a model that is both epigenetic and mechanical. And this was a very, very hard problem that no scientist managed to actually bring until the end of the 19th century. So really, uh, the key turn is the invention of a mechanical model of epigenesis, a mechanical account for the gradual elaboration of shapes, as we know today is happening, but was very, very hard to think, uh, scientifically and physically speaking. And so that really became a possible. So the notion of a biological information that is intrinsic, that is chemical in nature and heritable. And this is based on the chromosomic theory of heredity that was championed by Sutton and Bovary at the end of the 19th century only. And so to illustrate the ideas that biological information is such and that it contains in the form of DNA molecules in chromosomes, I could show you this article at the end of or beginning of the 20th century, 1904, where experiments from Theodore Bovary were actually would fuse cells um, by some uh, electric treatment. And the fusion of cells would cause actually random distribution of chromosomes. In other words, cells with aberrant karyotypes. They would have the wrong number of chromosomes. But then cells divide. And as they divide, they would produce uh, non-normal distribution of chromosomes, which we know could be a cause of cancer. And in embryos, led to developmental anomalies. So this experiment from Bovary actually demonstrated that chromosomes, which were just being discovered, were the carrier of some information in chemical in nature that was responsible for development. And this may sound like a random experiment, but it was actually a, a, the demonstration that, yes, indeed, there was a way to think 
physically, physical, chemically speaking, about the notion of heredity, the information had to be there. And we know the next step, of course, is the discovery of DNA and all of that. But this is really sort of the end point of a long journey that I rapidly summarize for you tonight. So yes, to the question, what is the nature of information? We know it is genetics. But we'll see, we'll have two other items to that. So it's just one step. So in thinking about genetics and how that actually may underlie um, uh, the formation of, of patterns, I would like to introduce to you a notion that is very important. And to that, I would just like to begin with what is a slight detour from the notion of genetics, which is Darcy Thompson. Darcy Thompson, at the beginning of the 20th century, championed the view that actually forget about genetics and even evolution, but think about mathematics and physical principles. We'll come back to that. So as an example of his thinking about how diversity of shapes arise, he said that you know, scientists could use actually coordinate systems, as you can see here. Not the organism would have a coordinate system, but really conformal mapping of these different, uh, dif of these different grids could, uh, could explain the emergence of diversity of shapes, of skulls in primates, or actually uh, shells in, um, on, in crabs here. So what would deform these structures would be forces, and they would strain the material. But really, I wanted here to point out to the notion of a coordinate system. Here, this is an artifice of the scientist to illustrate the concepts of deformation produced by forces. But it turns out that this very coordinate system is actually not just an artifice of scientists. It is actually a system, a process that actually cells in, or in an organism actually build from within to allocate a position to cells. And so this is a concept of positional information, which is a universal coordinate systems that is laid out in organisms. The very concept of positional information was first proposed in 1969 by Lewis Wolpert, an engineer by training turned into biology. His paper was very, very badly received by the biology community then. He posited the notion that there exists a system of coordinates that is very general, that could be used and reused by organisms to tell cells where they are, and based on this information, which could be chemical in nature, would be enough to tell them what to do, a muscle, a nerve, or whatever else. And so to illustrate the concept of positional information, he had this thought experiment, which is shown on the right. Consider an organism which is like a French flag. It has the genotype France, FR, and then another organism with the pattern of the uh, uh, American uh, stars and stripes, genotype US. And so we're going to do what people would do then, which is a graft experiment. You take a piece of the flag from France or from the US and move it to this position in the, uh, on the French flag. Now, you, two things could happen. You're going to transport and inherit within the graft your genotype, because, say, this could be like a graft from one organism to another. So you keep the genotype. So, of course, you will remain in this position, American, although you are grafted into a French flag organism. But the question is, what pattern would you produce? According to the positional information concept, you would recognize the coordinates, the new coordinates you have, because you've been shifted to a more dorsal anterior position, for instance, and therefore your pattern will be different. So you keep your genotype, your identity, but you uh, produce a pattern that corresponds to the new coordinate system. So that would tell that cells have a coordinate system. I do not have the time to go through an important experiment, but I could tell you that a key experiment done in the end of the 70s, actually exactly did this graft experiments and showed that, yes, cells could recognize, keep their identity, and actually adopt a new fate that is dependent on reading the local coordinates in the organisms. And the year 80s and 90s have been devoted to actually characterizing what are these molecules that actually supply chemical positional information. And I will give you one example. So first, it's very visual. As you probably know, organisms, in particular Drosophila, in the years uh, late 70s, early 80s, and beginning of 90s, identified a few genes that are enough to set up the coordinate system in an embryo. How does it look like in the fruit fly organism, Drosophila? Here's an egg. You can see colors. Colors would be uh, the distribution of uh, transcription factors that are distributed in gradients. And so the color of a cell here would be basically a local coordinate system. It would be the sum of three molecules that are shown here. But there are many more. In fact, about 15 molecules would be enough to produce exquisite coordinates that tell, the that tell a cell 
where is it along the anterior posterior axis or where along the dorsal ventral axis? So first, you have broad domains and then smaller domains, and in the end, the coordinates become increasingly precise so as to be about one uh, cell resolution along the anterior posterior axis. And this is the way you would produce coordinate systems. This has been first pioneered by uh, Janine Nislein Vollart and Eric Wishaus, who were awarded the Nobel Prize in 95, and many, many groups, tens of groups and thousands of people in many organisms have shown the validity of this way of thinking about how shape emerge. So a clear example of how you could use that to actually think in quantitative terms uh, and physically speaking about the notion of positional information is a concept of the morphogen gradient. A morphogen gradient is a notion that actually a molecule could form a concentration distribution of a substance, a given molecule, and that if this molecule has a capacity to elicit the activation of other genes, for instance, there would be a threshold of activation that would produce activation of a gene in the blue anterior region, another one in white, and a third in red. That just mirrors the notion of the French flag model from Welpert. But literally speaking, there turns out to be molecules that exactly do that, at least in the fly embryos, in another example since then. And so here is an example of a molecule shown in white whose distribution quantified here is exactly in a morphogen gradient. Now you could use genetics to increase or reduce the dose of this uh, gene. And what you will see that the distribution in, as an exponential decay function actually shifts more and more to the, entry, to the posterior region. And indeed, transiently, it's as if the cells are fated to form more and more of the head. So the head zone, which is initially small, due to the genetic perturbation, would produce a larger and larger head region in the embryo. So clearly, it's as if the cell system is responding to the dose of a molecule. Well, actually, you could do it exactly very precisely and consider the uh, production somewhere, the diffusion, and then degradation of the molecule. And using very simple principles of diffusion of the molecule and degradation at certain timescale tau, you could, yes, of course, predict an exponential decay function of the molecule, just as is observed in vivo. But the key point here is that from this simple model, very, very simple model, you could actually derive two important information, a length scale, which is the decay function of the gradient, dependent on diffusion and degradation, and a time scale, which is basically governed by diffusion. And so really, chemical systems allow a cell or an organism to define a time scale and a length scale of chemical processes, which is very important for explaining how patterns emerge uh, um, from a chemical point of view. So, yes, genetics and its correlate outcome chemistry provide positional information, layout patterns, and indeed because genes produce transcription factors that can regulate genes, there exist many more or less complex gene regulatory networks, as they are called, that allow the system to uh, uh, endow cells with particular decisions as to what they will become, say a neuron or a skin cell or a muscle cell. That is all very good and nice, but I would actually um, like to summarize a few points. Genetics does not and cannot prescribe the dynamics of cells and molecules in the details. There are too many molecules and cells to begin with. And so the, de in the information deployment depends on the physical world in which all of these chemical and genetic processes arise. Uh, the length scales and time scales as the nanometer scales of molecules uh, uh, actually control certain kinds of energy conversion processes, and, uh, uh, and living matter at the molecular scales, the nano world, is actually governed by non-equilibrium active processes that are uh, really important. And so these are not encoded genetically, of course, they are just properties of the um, physical systems, which I don't have the time to go into, but I'm happy to answer questions if you want. Um, and the last point is that physical constraints also impose uh, uh, are imposed by physical laws. You cannot violate A if equals MA, for instance. And there are, of course, as I illustrated, like diffusion sets a limit to how fast a process can happen, chemically speaking. So if you want to propagate an information of molecules faster than a diffusion, you have to do something. For instance, an action potential will require trigger wave dynamics. So this is just a way to say that on top of genetics and chemistry, mechanics is important to prescribe how deformations arise, what kind of deformations are possible consistent with the law of physics, uh, how fast they propagate, and what directions, and so on and so forth. And so to give you an example, and really showing you the kind of dynamics that we see in living systems, 
The way that cell shapes is controlled and the way that shape, cell shape changes arise is by controlling what is called the activity and contractility of a cell cortex. Think of it as a scaffold, a dynamic scaffold, that is made of filaments and greens powered by so-called molecular motors of the kind of myosin 2. These are the same motors that we have in muscles to move, but these are present in every cell from yeast all the way uh, to uh, um, humans. And you can see that here, this is a time lapse of cells in the skin, the dorsal skin of the Drosophila embryo. You did not, if you just look at the cells, you would see that they change their shape as if they are very much alive. And these deformations are actually powered by transient pulsatile contractions driven by the myosin 2 motors. I come back to that, but the myosin motors is as if beating like a heart and transiently deform the cells and then it sort of collapse and then a new pulse forms. So cell dynamics and cell shape changes are driven by such mechanical processes. If you care about not shape changes, but cell motility, these are like the Ferrari of cells. They move, these are keratocyte cells in a, in a fish. If you play them on the Petri dish, they move at a few microns per um, no, minute here on the right. And if you look in the stationary reference frame of the cell, uh, represented here, the kind of tension that happens, the membrane tension in yellow, the protrusive active forces from actin nucleation, and uh, the reward and the, uh, 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 and the uh, 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 force that arises from friction to the substrate. And that gives rise to motility, as well as in the purple in the back would be the contraction at the back of the cells. This is a very complex mechanic that has been worked out in detail by biologists and physicists over the years. And then going back to this sort of cartoon of a cell where uh, we computed time scales and length scales with chemistry, well, let's see how we could do it with just mechanics. So here what I'm showing you is a material, whether a cell or a tissue, in which you apply a stress from the outside. This is a green arrow here. And you ask, how is deformation propagating through the material? Well, it will propagate through the material, but that depends on the material properties of the tissue or cell. So so-called viscoelastic properties. And so here we have the stiffness uh, that is important to know, the viscosity as well as the friction with the uh, embedding medium. And so with those properties, you could actually compute a time scale, which is going to be the ratio of the viscosity over the uh, 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 stiffness, a length scale, which is going to be the square root of the viscosity over the friction. So yes, from a purely mechanical point of view, it is possible to define time scales and length scales. And to show you an example of that, you could see here deformations in the wing of this very fly drosophila that I showed you about. Well, I'm not showing you the details, but this is an example of an article where actually physicists and biologists actually very carefully defined what are the strains, their propagation, what are the stress that actually are happening and how they cause a particular field of deformation that is not random, but follows viscoelastic properties of the material. And other examples of how actually tissue deformation, say the bending of a tissue, its so-called invagination, arises from a specific pattern of contraction. If in orange these cells decide to activate contractility, as is shown in the movie, you have in green these molecular motors that I showed you before, the cell would become tiny, and this will give rise to an invagination. Another example would be actually tissue flows now. You have on the left, in two dimension, a chick embryo. It's not unlike what will happen in a human embryo, and where actually there are flows of cells that uh, or organize and emerge. They have bilateral symmetry. There are vortices that you could see now in the movie. On the right, you see actually flows not on a flat surface, but on an ellipsoid, which is the Drosophila embryo that we in my lab have been working on for at least 20 years. And so how do we explain these flows of cells in these very different organisms, very similar fundamental mechanical principles? If you follow the cells in, in details, they have polygonal shapes. And it's as if the, this tissue is like a fluid, a viscous fluid that flows along uh, the left right, which is the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. And you see that the cells have exchanged neighborhood. The blue and pink cells didn't touch each other at the beginning. And the yellow cells are going to be displaced. The blue and pink cells are going to touch each other. How is this ordered pattern of cell re reorganization taking place? It turns out that it happened in both a chick embryo and a fly embryo on very different geometries. And this is powered by very similar mechanical principles. The so-called T1 transition, which happens also in foams, in passive system, here is, act, is powered by 
active con control over the active contraction and contractility of cells. So in orange, you have the distribution of the myosin motors that drives contractility. This will give rise to this topological change in the cell configuration. And that drives the neighbor exchange and the tissue flow. So just control over the pattern of contractility in orange is sufficient to account for the net extension of the tissue, as we and our colleagues have shown. So yes, I think I've convinced you in just a few examples that mechanics is a key element that explains how forces arise, uh, how patterns arise. And the third and last element of, uh, of information is geometry. I will skip that for the sake of time, but I would like to lead you through a thought experiment. Take a cell, an E. coli cell, a bacterium, or any other cell, and you grind it to chemical homogeneity. You have lost the structures, but you have all the goodies, all the molecules, even DNA. And you ask yourself with a microscope, is the cell going to reform? So the answer is no. I see some people say no. Yes, you're right. But what is missing, if all the physical laws are there, the chemistry is complete, nothing is missing. So this is something to ponder on and think through, but it seems as if chemistry and mechanics are not enough to account for the emergence of shape. Otherwise, the cells would spontaneously reform, and it doesn't. So what is missing is precisely this missing bit of information, which I refer to as structure or geometry, which you need to inherit as a template to kickstart and maintain the organization of life from its dawn four billion years ago. And so this element of geometry, in the context of a fly embryo, which has been sort of my examples through this talk, would be the shape of the egg laid by the mother, and that kickstarts the embryo. So you see this is an ellipsoid. It is not a sphere. It is not a tube. It has a particular dimension and shape. And we showed, for instance, in this recent article that the curvature of the embryo of the egg is an information that, when it interacts with the contractility, is capable of driving the directional flow of the embryo toward the dorsal anterior region. I'm not going into the detail. I'm just telling you the example that geometry here is a, an information inherited from the mother and actually accounts for the symmetry breaking in the dynamics of the embryo. And here are examples of how actually changing the geometry, changing what is referred to as changing the boundary conditions of the system, is actually changing completely the dynamics. You could go from one directional flow to rotational flow, centripetal flow, or actually rotational flow in different organisms, just playing with the geometry, everything else being more or less similar. So, a few minutes to finish, I would like now to guide you through the concept of information flow. Now that we know better what is the nature of information, take a message, it is not just genes. We certainly are determined by genes because we know that twins are alike, but this is not to say that genes prescribe everything. They don't. Mechanics and geometry are very important. They play a causal role in an embedded network. So let's think now about the flow of information. There's one way to think about it, which is the most natural, which is the idea of a program. Say you build a monument, just like you think you build an embryo. What you want is some starting material, a bow plan, and then you will basically use that as information to prescribe mechanics and pre uh, predict shape changes. This is the way that we and many others have thought about and actually provided arguments to think about developments along these lines. The key element here is the notion of hierarchy and deterministic rules. Think of an orchestra. You need a conductor to follow a recipe and tell when and where people have to actually do their job. So the recipe and the conductor are sort of driving elements that run the program. And there's great examples of that. Think of this very famous graphic experiment in amphibian embryos from Hilde Mangold and Hans Spemann who in the year 20s actually showed that if you take the so-called blastopole lip of an embryo, graft it to the other pole in another host uh, embryo, you will form a twin. So the group of cells are capable of orchestrating a new axis. Spemann was a vitalist. He didn't think of molecules doing the job. But we know that there's an ensemble of molecules that actually are responsible for this phenomenon. And they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this notion of organizing center in 1926. Actually, not Mangold, because she tragically passed away before. In thinking about mechanics in embryo that I showed you, and then telling you before about positional information and chemical gradients, yes, of course, I will not run through it, but many arrows actually allow us to think about how patterning, chemical patterning, slays mechanics to do its job. 
But of course, this is not the only way to think about it. There's another way that is very much inspired from uh, the thinking of collective material in physics, which is that of self-organization. The notion of self-organization basically abandons the notion of hierarchy. There's no hierarchy. There are no even deterministic rules. The system is run by stochastic processes and fluctuations. And there are many feedbacks. So starting from components of a system, which, it, which can be characterized by its mechanics, its chemistry, and even its uh, geometry, the boundary conditions, you could predict and see the emergence of patterns. A very good example of that would be, of course, the way that termite mounds on ant colonies actually form, but also from chemical system, Turing instability is championed by Alan Turing in 1952 in his papers. But it actually traverses the field of biology, and in the last 20 years, we have seen more and more examples of how self-organization provides a mechanisms to account for very complex shapes with very little means. So here is an example of branching structures from the ER within cells to neurons, lungs, mammary glands, etc. But here's a movie of actually a neuron that we track in the lab in which you can see branching dynamics. So here, what we see is a mess at first value. It's also very beautiful. But you see what's going on in these neurons. They seem to have complex shape, yet we see a very stochastic branching dynamics. So we can account for the emergence of shape here, taking on board the fact that it is not deterministic, but actually has some fundamental stochastic dynamics. And we try to understand what are the rules of the stochastic dynamics that lead to the emergence of these complex shapes. And how could neurons be different based on differences in the stochastic dynamics? Likewise, the very pulsatility of contractile actomizing network is not genetically determined. It is actually powered by the spontaneous properties of interacting active stresses and passive resistance of the material, and etc. And so here, uh, we could build the equivalent of chemical Turing instabilities, but actually would be mechanical or actually mechanochemical Turing instabilities. I talked, to you, I talked to you about pulses, but this is an example of a wave that actually propagates through a tissue. That, again, is not genetically encoded. We actually even showed here that if we inject a drug that blocks transcription of all genes in the organism, the wave keeps going. It doesn't care about genetics at all. Once it has all the goodies, the self-interacting properties of the constituents give rise to a net wave of, 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 uh, of, of contractility through the embryo. And so this is my concluding slide. I basically have um, um, addressed the question of the origin of forms by building step by step the notion of guided self-organization. First, we had to consider that responding to the question, what is the nature of information? It has three modules. One is chemistry, of course, and it has a, 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 a analog, which is the genetic world, which is, of course, a chemical world. And so genes and molecules form a complex world of interaction that is essential. But that's not enough. Information is also mechanical and physical in nature. And the third is there's a statement about boundary conditions and properties of the structure that have to be inherited for a very cell to persist after cell division, for an egg to transmit the structure you know, from one generation to another. And short of that, if you just have mechanics and chemistry, just powered by self-organization, life would arrest instantly and forever on Earth. You would have to rewind the whole tape of evolution, which has been going on for four billion years. And in thinking about information flow between the three modules, there's a way to think about programs, which is one-dimensional, deterministic, or self-organized. And I would argue that in biology, you need both. There's nothing strictly deterministic, running a program. And likewise, there's nothing strictly self-organized, most likely. Because even in a cell, you need to inherit some structure. So you need to uh, inherit, in a broader uh, way, uh, you know, not only molecules, so the concept of heredity is much enlarged. It is a concept of heredity of structures, of mechanical properties of, of systems, as well as of chemistry. And so now is more like open questions to conclude. What are the utility of this combined system? I would argue that the advantage of having a self-organized dynamics is that it offers for little what I call creativity at low cost. If you don't need to prescribe every single branch of a neuron, if it happens by properties of self-organized branching dynamics, well, all you need is few parameters. In our model, we have just five parameters. This gives 
a huge exploratory power. The default state is producing structures. They will not be very reproducible. That's why you may actually need canalization or robust uh, uh, processes that control the robustness of the system. And we think that having heredity and other deterministic programs might be a way to actually constrain the intrinsic self-organization of system to yield reproducible outcomes. This is a working hypothesis. This is a way that we think about the utility of both systems for the persistence evolution of living systems, which I uh, presented in the introduction. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the notion of universality, having in mind a physical chemical description of processes beyond the name of genes, we could see that there are universal laws of physics and chemistry that actually, I think, provide a way to understand how um, uh, you know, universal geometric features arise in evolution. This is a work of, I, I mentioned on the way, the work of few people in my lab, and so they are shown in these pictures. Our group is working on many aspects of morphogenesis from embryo, neurons, tissues, organs. This is embedded in the beautiful environment of Marseille. This is uh, the picture that actually depicts um, where my campus is located. Also a very nice place. This is our campus. With a, it's, not a, it's an architect picture, but the real buildings are like that. This is close to the natural camp, uh, national uh, 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 National Reserve, and uh, this is the sea that you can, the view from the sea that you could see just 30 minutes walk from the lab. And so, thank you very much. I will be very happy to take any question.